Well, thank you for joining me for another video interview, uh, this one conducted over Skype with top global IT executives. Our guest today is Sergei Belosov. He is a Russian entrepreneur who's been in Singapore for the past 20 years. He's known as the king of data, and he's the chairman of Parallels and the current and the CEO of Acronis. Sergei, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, um, I've got uh, I've got you on uh, Skype here on my on my phone. It's a little bit scratchy. I'm sorry about that. But look, you were born into communist Russia. I mean, I was I, I was born in Australia to to Russian parents. So I only got to hear about it, but you got to live it. <laughs> and um, you're now one of the the tech world's most successful capitalists. So you know, not only involved in highly profitable and technologically advanced companies, but also in the venture capital space. Now, when I remember my first computer uh, in 1979, before the IBM PC, but I remember seeing in uh, magazines about Russian Apple II clones, and I was wondering what were the computers that you were using in Russia when it was still communist and behind the Iron Curtain? Well, I think it's not a fact uh, about that it was communist. Uh, it, it, it was just, uh, you know, I'm 44, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and so at that time, uh, there was not so many computers anywhere, but uh, my dad uh, was a professor of St. Petersburg University, and so was my mom, and they uh, had computers in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, so they used uh, some. Um, they used some. Uh, they used some uh, uh, clones of uh, PC, which mm -hmm. were uh, made in Russia, which were called uh, digital computerized. Uh, uh, something he called Devaka, <laughs> yeah. and then uh, some people would have Apple actually in in couple of labs they had uh, Apple, mm -hmm. and in some uh, clubs they would have a PC. So nothing unusual really. Yeah, pretty common. Then of course at that time when I was studying in school, uh, there was also uh, mainframes, right? But there were sort of Russian variants of mainframes, but. It was similar to whatever you would find abroad, so not maybe slightly uh, behind, but not really very behind. Sure, sure. And so, were your parents the spark that got you in involved or interested in technology, or did you sort of? I mean, what was the what what, what got you involved in it? I have a very very uh, messy and uh, rather unusual career, and so you know, it's not any specific one thing. I, I think. My parents got me involved in science, right? Mm -hmm. So I uh, went to a specialized um, uh, high school for uh, physics and mathematics, biology and chemistry. And I've uh, spent a lot of time in the labs of my parents because, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you know, I was, I, I suppose I wasn't a very good behavior, so I, I wouldn't be fitting very well in a lot of kindergartens. Yeah. And so they take me to the lab. And so I was there. Uh, from I don't know the I mean the first some of the first memories I remember is about the, my mom's lab and my, my dad's lab and I would spend time there every day or almost every day but uh, I was uh, going to be scientist not not a technologist right and um, so I mean the, the fact that you're one of the top technology people today must you know must have shocked you a bit if you were to think about it I mean if you were a scientist you might you might have you know worked on uh, Nuclear medicine or something like that. I'm 44 years old and I'm 23 years in business, 23 and a half, and and uh, that is all over the world, including Asia and Europe and Africa and Latin America and uh, US and whatever. And so nothing shocks me anymore. Nothing shocks right? me. <laughs> so it doesn't shock me right now. No. Uh, I think it's kind of pretty natural. I, I think uh, if you look at what uh, I've done when I was a child, that was more turned to be an entrepreneur and a business person than a scientist. But I did study physics and engineering and computer science. And so uh, as I started uh, doing business, it's natural that I ended up in, in technology business. Sure. Did you study any, any rocket science? Well, I mean, technically, I, I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist. The, re the reason I ask that is because there's a funny joke, there's a funny saying in English, whenever you have something that's not complicated, they say, oh, well, it's not rocket science. So, <laughs> yeah, you know what it is, right? But I'm just saying uh, that uh, rocket science is exactly what we studied. Right. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. In case it's actually not fact, 
we studied um, in, in my university, uh, which was the top university of Soviet and Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology for whatever we had the uh, uh, we, we the people who would be admitted would go to the uh, compulsory military service so they would would, would be acquitted from it mm -hmm. but instead they needed to study to be a lieutenant of strategic defense that means effectively they would be uh, operating uh, uh, nuclear missiles right which at that time were targeted at uh, US and other countries like this and so uh, and and then um, the university itself, when it was founded, it was founded uh, for multiple reasons. But one of the main reasons was to design uh, 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 science, to design rocket defense system and to design rockets. So we are literally rocket scientists. Well, there you go. Well, there you go. So when someone says to you, "It's not rocket science," you can say, "No, because I studied it, and it's definitely not, or or definitely is." <laughs> so, exactly. You see, what's another thing about you know, I I I I've, um, lived like 23 years all over the world and 21 year in Russia but uh, you know I guess I have a Russian culture mm -hmm. in, in me and, and Russians are very serious people so when you ask me a question I will have to answer the question very precisely sure <laughs> that almost sounds a bit German too you know they're very very serious people as well yeah 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 so um, what's the what's a, a little bit of the story you can share about some of your time at Sunrise, which I, I mean I've read some of the interviews about about you, and that was a Russian computer company. Uh, it, it's yeah, well, okay, uh, it's it's uh, so the short I version. The short in high version. school, I yeah. completed um, four uh, four years, which is sort of bachelor's degree, right? And and then I was going for my masters, and then the mid break. Uh, you know, and at that time, Soviet Union collapsed, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there was sort of Russia, and and the, Russia was very rapidly becoming a capitalistic country and privatizing, and so a bunch of, um, and, and so money were important at that time. It was not possible to survive with, well without money. And mm -hmm. So I went into multiple uh, sort of businesses, and, and while doing those businesses, I was... Um, using the office of some people who started doing computer manufacturing and and I was helping them and at some point they invited me to be their partner and and to be in charge of uh, multiple things in the company and that, that's how I ended up being sort of co-founder of Sunrise. Sunrise is actually the only company which I did not really create. I was sort of invited to be a partner. Yeah. So, are, are there any other exciting technological stories from your youth that, that are worth sharing in this short time that we have? Technological studies from my youth. Stories, my stories. Yeah. Yeah. So how about the story of right now, which yeah. is ironic? Well, actually, before, we'll get onto that in a sec. I've seen a picture on Facebook of you next to a young Bill Gates, and you were young too. What's the story behind that picture? Uh, yeah, in 1996, we started selling and marketing software, and almost immediately, we started um, developing our own software, mm -hmm. and we used a uh, very uh, uh, cool, we thought at the time, new uh, uh, back office architectures from Microsoft. Yeah. And we were based in Singapore, and then when Bill Gates was visiting Singapore, they have found nobody better to show to Bill Gates but us. Yeah. This was 97. I wasn't particularly... At that time, I was already in business for, uh, you know, for, for five or three years, and I was uh, already 26, 25 again. So, not so, so young from my standpoint. I was old. Yeah. So, so what was the biggest challenge in, in maturing Acronis, we're going to come to the future now, into the multi-billion dollar company it is today? I mean, I understand that you retook the helm as CEO last year or in the last couple of years. Right. Well, I, I never was CEO of Acronis in the past. No? Okay. I was in Open Acronis and Acronis was part of Parallels and I split Acronis and after we split there was uh, actually four different management teams. And, and I was the chairman of the board for a little while, but then from 2007 till 2013, I was just, you know, very passive board member. Mm -hmm. And then, this is not a multi-billion dollar business, it's a multi-hundred million dollar business. Yeah. And we want to make it a multi-billion dollar business. What's the challenge? It's very hard to say what the one specific challenge. It's, uh, you know, doing, uh, building big businesses, it's complicated and the 
challenges everywhere, including competitors, including employees, including uh, processes, including products. And so there is challenges everywhere. I, I don't think there is any one particular challenge, but at the end of the day, for any company, which is technology company, the most important thing is, mm, uh, hence the word, technology company, technology. And so if you have great technology and great products, uh, you, you win. And, and, you know, the biggest challenge is to build the products which allow us to scale to a bigger multi-billion dollar business. That's the biggest challenge. Now, at, at the moment, um, you've got software, software for, for businesses, consumers and enterprise. And I, I want to know more about that in a second. But are you ever going to move into into hardware, maybe backup appliances or some other sort of hardware? We, so, that, so, that's... So, 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 so it's not really, uh, you know, we are not about uh, any specific uh, method of solving the problem. We're solving the problem of protecting data. Mm -hmm and storing data and managing data and for that we today use software as the primary thing but we also have services that means that we use hardware as well so uh, we will do whatever is best to solve the customer problems but um, you know we don't have immediate plans uh, to uh, plans to, to build our own hardware some people just showing up at the office. So. okay that's all right yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of hardware builders out there anyway. I mean, we don't necessarily need another one. We need we need companies that focus on doing something really well. I, I, I'm not, uh, you know, so hardware storage is a very interesting uh, space, right? So if you think about any computing, it's about really three things. It's about network, it's about storage, and it's about, you know, compute itself. Compute, storage, network. And, you know, compute today is, um, it's, it's, it's in a challenging time, but... Uh, not yet uh, to the extent of a uh, huge changes. So if we think about compute uh, 10, 20 years from now, we will get a uh, major changes because we will have to change the way how the CPUs are built. We will have maybe quantum computers or some new generation computers. But for now, it's relatively steady. And uh, network is also relatively steady. In fact, there is a lot of bandwidth which is not fully utilized. In, in many places. So if you think about it, uh, the local networks uh, have been, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 megabit and then 100 megabit and then 1 gigabit and now it's 10 gigabit. But frankly speaking, I, I think nobody really even noticed uh, the difference between 10 gigabit and 1 gigabit. Hmm. So network is also not fully utilized, but storage is very different. So storage is too slow, it's too large and it's too expensive and, and there is explosion of data and, and so uh, I think there is a lot of innovation which will happen on hardware as well, and we might participate. So I, I don't necessarily think that we will not. It's system builders, yes, there's a lot of system builders, but the modern storage uh, is, is rather outdated. The hard disks, the flash, the tapes, the optical storage, all of this is too large, too expensive, too fragile. Um, you know, performance is not good, and mm. so on and so forth. So there, there, there could be an innovation in storage hardware, and we might participate. Sure. Well, I mean, Intel and Micron say they're working or have worked uh, to create a type of flash that's one thousand times as fast as the flash we use today. So I yeah, mean, but that's just speed, right? That's but just speed. Think about it. You want to store your interview in such a way that a million years from now, somebody will see. Um, yeah. Right? Uh, well, that's that's right. From now, somebody find uh, this interview and they seem like this weird species uh, what are they talking about yeah, right? yeah. and, and they seem like okay well there is no storage which allows you to do that right no so not, not at the moment other yeah. storages are uh, going to save it only for 10 years and yeah faster yes it's, it's very fast but uh, that's not the only characteristic it also needs to be cheap that's right right yeah. so yeah imagine you want to store a terabyte of data, not so much terabyte of data, so you can easily make a 10 gigabit movie, yeah. and a gigabyte movie, so 100 movies, 100 movies for for a million years, how much it's gonna cost you per year, quite a lot. So Amazon price uh, for terabyte today is, uh, what is that, 2.727, it's uh, uh, 27,000 dollars a year, yeah, two point seven thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. right? I see uh, for terabyte. It's quite a lot. 
it's it's it, it's effective. It, it's a, is it two point seven? No, I'm probably not calculating correctly. It's two point seven cents. It's so it's twenty seven cents, uh, and and then it's yeah, it's actually more uh, than twenty seven dollars to two hundred seventy dollars. Yeah, doesn't matter. It's expensive. And yeah. so expensive, long term. Uh, 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 it's it's all all of the problem. Also the size, right? Think about you know you 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 have uh, you know. Uh, one rack today, which can only store one petabyte of data. One rack, that's, you know, 40 U's. It's, it's a sort of a cabinet. Yeah, yeah. One petabyte, right? Okay, maybe two petabyte. Well, two petabyte, uh, it's not so much data. So, uh, you know, for example, Acronis does backup of about 100 exabytes of data. 200 exabytes of I was data. Gonna, I was going to ask how so much storage you guys have. Well, that's 200,000 racks. Yeah. Hundred thousand racks. The typical data center, sort of a large data center, would allow you to put one thousand racks or ten thousand racks. Yeah. So we're talking about, um, you know, two hundred data centers. Yeah. Right. And and so it's it's so yeah. I mean, the point is, uh, there is a lot of problems with storage which need to be resolved on all levels, including hardware. Do you think uh, the concept of holographic storage is real? I mean, we've heard about that, but I think it's still more or less science fiction, isn't it? No, no, no. There's all kinds of storage. Storage is a very, uh, a very convoluted word, right? So, what is storage? Is that something where you can write something and then later you can read this, right? Yeah. So there is holographic storage today. The problem is that uh, uh, how fast it is, how cheap it is, how reliable it is, how, 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 what is the density of storage? So it's not. Uh, but yes, it's not a production quality. You cannot really put holographic storage inside your iPhone. So if you were looking at the backup or storage industry over the next 10 years, then, then would you say that, that new forms and, and much faster and more robust forms of storage are probably going to be the big developments in that time frame? Uh, yes, I think so. Because now we're coming to an inflection point. The world, there, there is sort of uh, two important inflection points, um, or three. So one important inflection point is called um, uh, big data. Yeah. And big data is about actually making sense of data. And, and so there is a lot of data which either already is generated or can be generated by the world by uh, various sensors which in the world, by various devices which in the world. But before big data, that data would be sort of dormant. Now, with big data, you potentially have a smart analytics which allows you to extract value from data. All of a sudden, you can find data and you can extract more money from data than you can extract from a diamond mine in, in many cases, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. And that leads to explosion of data because all of a sudden it becomes, um, you know, it becomes uh, valuable to have more data. And, and so the data is exploding and as it's exploding, there is no place to store it. Today, the world can generate about three to four times more data then all of the storage manufacturers are making, right? So you cannot store all of the data. But in the past it was okay because, you know, you would generate the data, but since you cannot do too much with it, most of the data you just throw away. Well, now you can make money from it. So you want to store it, and, and, but there is no storage. And so that's one thing. But the other thing, which is quite important, it's called singularity, right? Yeah. And yeah. people talk about singularity all the time, but for me singularity is when the world becomes much more digital than it's physical. So today, most of the world is physical, right? So uh, it's much more digital, uh, and digital world is much bigger than it was, for example, 100 years ago. At that time, there was no digital world. Sure. Now there is digital world. But as we move forward, the uh, world will become more digital than physical. And, and, and that's, you know, a very important change where suddenly, uh, you know, uh, digital world in its own will have to be over-sustained and will have to be staying forever because it, it's more important than the physical world. And the final thing, and that's also another major uh, change, is artificial intelligence, right? So today, when you lose data, you don't lose lives, okay? When we are talking about the chronis, we are talking about uh, uh, the fact that losing data is equal to losing lives. But the reality is that if you lose data, it's just business. You lose money, right? Hmm. 
you can technically lose life because you can lose a little bit of time or it could be some valuable data which leads to loss of life. But in most cases, it's not direct. While with artificial intelligence, you almost have digital beams, right? And so losing those beams is exactly equal to losing lives. To, to losing lives. And so that, that makes storage super critical. It, it, it has to be much more, uh, much more physical, much more, you know, you can, like, you know, pharaohs have lived 7,000 or 8,000 years ago, right? But we still can see the pyramids. Yeah. Because physical world is very persistent. There is no storage today which would allow you to store data for 6,000 years. And, yeah. and so, uh, again, so it's, it's uh, lots of changes in storage are coming. I mean, I, I, I know that you also are involved in venture capital. Are any of the firms that you're funding working on new types of storage? Well, I, I'm not involved in venture capital. I was involved in venture capital. There is a, uh, there is a fund where I'm still a partner, but I'm focused on acronyms. Sure. Sure. And, and the fund funds a lot of different companies, including storage companies. Sure. Well, there you go. Well, you're making sure that you're... you're um... And this is not what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Now, I mean, and, I mean what about the role of, of quantum computing in storage? I know that uh, one of the companies that your venture capital firm that you're a part of in, invested in was ID... Uh, Quantique, and you've done a deal recently with ID, ID Quantique. Um, yeah. I mean, can ID you... Quantique is not about quantum computers, it's about quantum communication mm -hmm. and about new generation secure communication, and it's about quantum privacy and about new generation privacy. And does that also mean uh, quantum encryption of, of your data? Yeah, but it's, it's not really encryption. Encryption itself is just a method. What you really worried about is privacy and security. And so actually, uh, quantum encryption is a bit uh, a strange term. Really, there is no quantum encryption. Yeah. It's just if you use quantum communication as a method, your data cannot be copied. That's a feature of quantum data. And so it cannot be listened to. Yeah. But it's not technically encrypted. It's just it cannot be copied. Because if it's copied, it's destroyed. And so you can only exist in one sort of um, sample. And storage of quantum data is a major problem. Today, uh, there is no reliable storage of quantum data. And if quantum computers are ever built, a uh, major challenge is to actually store quantum data. That's if system qubits, uh, basically quantum storage, are a major problem. The longest living qubits today are several hours. Uh, not even several days, mm -hmm. not to say several millions of years, right? So it's, it's very, very short. And, and yes, uh, uh, that's a big area. For quantum communications, quantum storage is also important because one thing which is important for quantum communications is so-called quantum repeaters. That means that if you are in Australia, I'm in Boston. So which city are you in? in Sydney. Sydney, okay. So you're in Sydney, right around the other side of the world. So if I send you a photon, uh, uh, along the way, between me and you, there should be right around uh, perhaps 100 places where this photon needs to be retransmitted. And in order for it to be retransmitted in such ways that it will keep its quantum state, you have to have a device which is called quantum repeater, which is effectively storing that qubit and then sending it. And, and so, uh, again, quantum storage is important. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I've got questions here about, silly questions about if you've ever seen Schrodinger's cat, but I mean, it's all silly stuff. Is it, what, what, what other cool stuff can you tell us about what you're doing at Acronis now and, you know, the, the things that are going to happen? I mean, this year you introduced cloud everywhere. You know, what, what are we, what are we going to see in Acronis 2017? What, what are the other cool so, things that you're working on that we should know about? I'm, I'm blessed with meeting some very cool people, right? And so one of the cool people I've met early in my career is Bill Gates, right? And, yeah. and you've seen the photo. But the other cool people I've uh, met and dealt with a lot is um, Steve Jobs. Yeah, Apple. right. And one thing which you can never ask Apple is what does he work on? Yeah. And so, <laughs> of course, it's not like this, but kind of similar. We are yeah. working on a lot of cool things. And they're all about um, uh, actually protecting data, making sure that data is uh, never lost. Uh, can be easily accessed, can be found, and so on, can be transferred, is in your control, is secure, it's private. And, and, and it's all about uh, enhancing our Acronis cloud platform. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
um, you know, there's not, not something which we will talk specifically. You ask no, questions, sorry. which are good questions. Are we working on hardware? We might. And are we working on, uh, you know, some sort of sci-fi type hardware like uh, quantum storage or quantum uh, ca- communication? We might, but we're not going to talk about it. Sure, sure. I understand. I mean, you don't want to give all the secrets away to the competitors, that's for sure. Um, so, let me just look over here. So, I mean, you know, I, I guess as we get towards the end, end of the interview, I mean, one question I always like to ask is what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received that's helped you to get to where you are today, which you can share with the audience? I don't know. It, it's very difficult to say that there is a single piece of advice. Sure. Uh, which, uh, I can give some advice, but... Yeah, you go know, for it. It's not any, uh, you know, one thing which is important if you want to build uh, uh, businesses and technology businesses is to, uh, uh, to actually uh, never give up. Yeah, that's true. I've because, seen it. Yeah. Uh, there is a misinterpretation of the fact that it's easy to build businesses. It's never easy. It's hard. And the harder it is, the better the business. You know, there is a uh, some common sort of misconception that when you're doing something which is great, it becomes easy. It becomes fun. And it is fun, but it's not the kind of fun like a party kind of fun. But it's kind of fun, like climbing the Mount Everest yeah. type fun, right? So I'm sure the, the mountain climbers, uh, which are climbing Mount Everest, they are enjoying it. But if you ask them, are you scared? They say, yeah, we're scared shitless all yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. Right? So it's a different kind of fun. That's right. That's and so right. the harder it is, the more valuable it is. But so never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Very good. Very good advice. So. Do you have any final messages for ITY viewers and readers and for your current and future customers? I think it's very basic messages. People don't uh, today um, uh, really appreciate the importance of data. Not yet. It's becoming more and more apparent that everything you do becomes data. Money is data. Your life is data. Mm. You die, uh, what's left of you is data. Yeah. Nothing else. Digital pictures, digital movies digital records, and, and so preserving your data is very important. The moments of your life, the value in your life, the health, everything depends on data, and so making sure that your data is yours, so it's private, is secured, and it's safe, is very, very important, and we want to help. Okay, so guys, thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time from, from Boston in the US, and I hope to see you when you come back to Australia. Yes, most certainly. It's okay. not far from Singapore. That's right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now. Thanks.